if we're trying to figure out why hummingbirds are able to exist, like live at high altitudes, because they need a lot of oxygen, because they have a really fast metabolism. And they concluded that they have uh, mutation with their hemoglobin, like it, they called it a different isoform, I think, or something like that, which makes it so that they're able to take up oxygen much faster than you or me would. Okay. How high can these hummingbirds fly? Too high. What was the maximum height they determined they could actually fly at? Like 43,000 feet. What? Where do airplanes fly? 30, 30, 30, 30, Not that high. About 30 to 35 in that range, depending which way they're going and such, and the air currents. All right. So that's higher than an airplane can fly, or typically flies, I should say. Why? Why would a bird need this ability? To look cool. To look cool. I'm <laughs> to sure get that's some all mates. <laughs> well, there's something in that one potentially, but all right. So, what is it? What's what's vital here that we're talking about that allows for the hummingbird to go this high? Could it be to escape predators? Okay, escaping predators might be one. There aren't too many things that fly that high. Even birds of prey, right? Don't typically go that high. It can just be the result of a random mutation that happened. But what did they observe as they continued looking into this? There's certain mutations that is, are associated with what? The altitude that they live at. The altitude that they live at. And they found that when they looked at the data, it didn't matter if you went with the lowest altitude, the highest altitude, or the mean altitude, it still tracked all the same. So it's true that it could just be a mutation, but the result of that mutation does what, potentially? Puts them live at higher altitudes. It gives them more habitat. More habitat means not competing with the other hummingbirds. Maybe they can get more cakes. Right. <laughs> Send it. So there you go. All right, so with that then, the question then comes up, have all of the hummingbird species evolved this way? No, they have not. But what did you learn about birds generally in this study? Anybody get to the ducks? Nobody made it to the ducks. The waterfowl. The waterfowl. Aren't you little? Yes, David. I mean, the ducks, they just sort of, like, they might have some similar mutations, so it might be kind of a common thing that has evolved in different ways. Okay, so this is what's interesting, is some of the ducks that they were able to analyze in the Andes, in the Andes also have a similar mutation. Now, the mutation itself is in two places, correct? Anybody recall where they were? I know one is beta, uh, the beta 13. Okay, beta 13, that's one, and the other one was? Beta 83, so 13 and 83, all right? Pretty easy that way, both into threes. So, all right, what kind of mutation was, what, what's typical for the low altitude hummingbirds? Both glycine or both serine? Weird. All right, but both glycine seems to be the common one. And then what happens as you go to higher altitudes? We see that the serine becomes more prominent, right? Now, what's weird about it is you can have sometimes where it just has one or the other as well. That's what they saw when they did sequence alignment of the data, correct? All right, so let's go ahead and skip along here. So um, so these are the questions I think you've already been given? Yep. Yes, all right. So let's come back to that in a few minutes. Did anybody watch the documentary, by the way? It wouldn't load? Oh, that's good. I only got like a 10 minute clip. Just a 10 minute clip and then you have to pay for the rest or something? No, it says the video's not available. It says expired. Oh. Really? I'm not I'm about about giving you expired. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, right. I wanted to learn about that. Yeah. Come on, Al. It's the only way I want to. I would, I would totally watch it. All right, so if we're looking at this, we notice that you can actually break out the birds into different groups based off the sequence alignment of the, of the proteins. So you recall, we can take the primary structure, primary structure, right? And we can align primary structure of different proteins from different organisms, and we can look to see if there are differences, or mutations as we often refer to them as. All right, and those mutations can be benign, or they can be significant. And so often what we'll see is that you can group certain organisms together because they carry a very similar mutation pattern. In other words, over time, these group, this group here, they're closer to each other, in terms of the number of uh, the amino acids where they're located and what they are, compared to this group up above. 
but these two share more commonly mutations compared to these others, all right? And so this phylogenetic tree is what they're using to try to make some of the, to try to get, got, gain some inf insight into what's going on here. And so they went ahead and looked at this, and they also plotted against the elevation range. So they can see that from sea level all the way up to 5,000 meters, and we can see what kind of birds there are. Notice we have some that live at high altitude and some that live at lower altitude, some high, some middle, some all over the place. The giant hummingbird just doesn't seem to make up its mind. All right, so and then we have a few others that are low. Now, looking at these differences, we can then break them out into groups and see if there's anything common between those that live at high altitude versus low altitude, correct? And that's what they were looking for. They're like, okay, is there something special about the hemoglobin in these high altitude hummingbirds? All right, so they went ahead and looked at that, and so here's the HbO2 affinity, so the affinity of the, for oxygen for the hemoglobin and the native elevation. This is what they saw. So if you're looking at this, what do we have on the x-axis? We have a standard contrast elevation midpoint. So here they're saying, okay, here's our zero midpoint. Those are ones that are high, the ones that are low elevation comparatively. So you can just say middle range. Then they went over here and they said, same thing. We're going to look at the standard contra the contrast of the affinity. So you have a normal affinity and you have a high affinity and a low affinity, all right? So if we're looking at this, what do we, what do we end up observing in this data? Wait a minute, because there's negative numbers. There is, are it saying, is it saying that if you have a higher affinity of oxygen, you generally live at a lower than average um, altitude? So if we go to the zero point, right? Zero and zero. So anything that actually ends up in which quadrant? So we would expect, we could, have, we could have had a scatter across all this, right? But what do we actually observe? There's almost something of a linear fit. Yeah. And so what's the relationship here? Um, so the higher the partial pressure, so right, because there's more oxygen, so it doesn't take as much to bind it, right? Yeah. So exactly. High elevation birds have a higher affinity for oxygen. Okay, so they have a higher affinity, meaning it's down here. So negative correlation value between the HBD high affinity, the HBA low affinity, native elevations, but only with respect to what? So this is only when you see what present with the hemoglobin. Oh, for what it's saying here? Yeah, but we're going to infer what the next graph is. So they say this. This is a claim they make, but the actual information was in the supplementary information. So if you read the paper, you didn't actually see the graph that makes this actually stand out. All right, so what do they say here? Negative correlation exists only with KCL and IHP present. What, or what's the KCL, what's the IHP? So potassium chloride, specifically what was important, the potassium or the chloride? The chloride. The chloride. And what about what's IHP? Uh, Idaho Highway Patrol? No. <laughs> uh, is there iodine in that? Uh, no it's iodine. It's phosphate. Phosphate. It's phosphate containing, it's basically a sugar that has how much phosphate on it? A lot. H stands for hex. So there's six phosphate groups. Six phosphate groups around this. It looks super bizarre. All right, so let's take a look at this. All right, so what we observe, this is the molecule. Now, what's the analogous molecule that we would be concerned with in humans? They actually, well, they said that even birds use pentaphosphate. Right. They're just using this because it's more stable. Yes. So what are, we, what are we normally concerned about in terms of a molecule that has phosphate and such? The phosphatidyl glycerate, right? So they're saying this is a mimic for the regulatory molecule that helps to stabilize a conformation of the hemoglobin. In other words, there's a place where it can bind. All right. Now, what's interesting here is notice the data that exists here. So here's our partial pressure of oxygen. So increasing partial pressure means that you're going to saturate the hemoglobin, right? Over here, we're looking at our, like, our fractional binding theta. And looking at these, notice if we have it stripped, in other words, none of the IHP and not the chloride either, we see the graph has the greatest affinity for oxygen. Makes sense, because these are supposed to help put it in the low affinity state, right? In other words, these help to dump the oxygen, is what you can look at this. Now, which of the two has more influence on this? The IHP does. The IHP will actually shift it to a low affinity state more. So that's what we start to see. 
Um, so they have a model up here. So you see your four different uh, boxes. They represent uh, subunit of hemoglobin. The top two are the alpha, the bottom two are beta. Okay. All right. And they indicate that you have OHP bound between the two betas and chlorides that are associating with the termini is really what they're kind of making it seem like. If oxygen is bound, those things released, then that means we have a relaxed state that goes on, and that's what's going to be favored when those are not present. So that's their model trying to explain what they see. All right. Um, they did a lot. They looked at a lot of data here. So, did anybody read how they actually did this experiment? Not really. Okay. Let me just describe. This is really good biochemistry, actually. Whether you care about birds or not, right? Hmm. You think the science is for the birds? So be it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. One, per, uh. one gratuitous. <laughs> eh. All right. So, what they did was because they the first thing you note the differences in the genetic information, correct? As a biochemist. You could go slaughter the birds, and you can isolate hemoglobin from, he from the birds. But what's the problem with the sample here? It's a hummingbird. It's really small. Are you going to really try to get that many hummingbirds to get enough sample? <laughs> You'd probably be like considered cruel or something like that. So the option is to do what? Torture. Tag and breed, but biochemistry, they like to go a little different. So, hey, what if we would just go extract the genetic information and produce the proteins, purify those proteins out, and then do this kind of test in a device? So we can actually just measure the hemoglobin itself and how it behaves in the presence or absence of these effectors. That's exactly what they did. So they had to take the genetic information, and they were going to produce it in E. coli. Here's a note. Hummingbirds and E. coli are not that closely related on the phylogenetic tree. I don't know if you've noticed that before. All right. So one of the problems that exists is when you're looking at organisms, they have preferential codon use. You'll talk about this in a couple weeks, I'm guessing, when you start talking about DNA and all that kind of stuff. But there's a preferential codon use by organism at times. And so the further apart you get, there can be a difference in what the codon is and what amino acid it might code for preferentially. Usually what it really means is there's redundancy in the codons, and so one of the redundant codons is used preferentially by the bacteria, whereas the bird would use another one of those codons. So it doesn't recognize it quite as effective if you switch it over. So they went ahead and they took the information and they sent it to a company that just synthesizes DNA strands, and they literally synthesized the whole gene. It's becoming more and more common, by the way. And they did it so it's optimized for the part, the codons of E. coli, so that E. coli would make the right protein every time. The other thing they also talk about is that you noted that the terminus is always something like a valine or something like that. We've never seen a methionine at the in terminus. I don't know if you're really watching for that, but you never saw methionine, and methionine is what starts all protein sequences. So if you look in the paper, they actually say they co-expressed with the hemoglobin protein subunits a protein called methionine aminopeptidase. It just cuts the N-terminal methionine off. Because they wanted to make sure that it was the fully folded form, because the N-terminus is important, is it not? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it's important. So we need to make sure we have the correct N-terminus and not a methionine hanging out there messing it up. So they did all of that, and then they were able to do this right here. This data all came from a very small device where they could pipe in a, pipette in a few mi microliters of their protein solution, and then they could examine how it would behave under these different conditions of partial pressure of oxygen with the addition or subtraction of the chloride and the IHP. I thought that was a very nice biochemical experiment. In other words, no hummingbirds were harmed in the making of this data. All right. Not in this study. They did it just hummingbird free. Somebody else may have killed hummingbirds, but it wasn't them. <laughs> the middleman. <laughs> no, you, 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 you can get that off a feather or whatever. It's not, it doesn't have to be intrusive necessarily. So, and I think they actually just ordered it from somewhere. So, all right. Because they didn't need the gene itself because they had it synthesized, so they just needed the sequence. That means you could just have somebody else had to sequence the hummingbird. I don't know what happened to that poor hummingbird. Okay. I do want to confirm this. Yes. This table is was this what was used to produce the graph that we looked at earlier? With the a lot of this data is based on the, the the graph that we saw would be a lot of this kind of data right here. So you okay. see your different partial pressure. Well, this is all set at the same partial pressure, so it's not the variable partial pressure. 
because okay. they're trying to look at it. Why, why, why would they be at P50? Why P50? 50-50 saturation. 50-50 saturation. Where is that on our graph? Let's just go back for a second. Where is that on the graph? Oh, that's the middle. That's the... Um, yeah, P50, right? At the 0. 0.5, the halfway, 50% occupied. And so, you see, that's where they actually use... Why not, why not try to use one? Were we able to use this? Yeah, it's not... You can't always get there. That's like... The theoretical maximum, right? You yeah. may not get there every time. Why not use something really low? Not zero, of course, because that's pathetic, and you need to get no data out of that. Why not do something down here? I mean, didn't we talk about how there's a, a direct relationship between the 50% mark and your KV? We'll talk, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. There's another comment I heard. Yeah. Who's the other one? Oh, yeah, down here, good luck getting good air. You're going to have air like crazy in your measurements. So you're not going to have as good of data. So having it somewhere in the middle ground actually leads to good data. And it is the place where we get the KD value, right? Remember KD was you start here, you come over the line, drop down, and there's your KD. Concentration. So why not compare them at their characteristic KD? And that's really what they're getting out of this data. So if this is the P50, we're looking at KD values and comparing them. So the N50 is the KD? Um, the N50, oh, what was the N50 again? Yes. Okay. What P50? Is that also key? That's just the pressure. So it's the mean of, the, of these uh, cooperativity yeah. coefficients. All right, so with this, they're able to actually compare all these different mutations, right? These different forms of birds, and they can look at the mutations that were present, and they can try to draw a conclusion. What conclusion did they draw? Okay, that something, there's a difference between them when they have both mutations present. Do either of those mutations actually confer an enhanced ability? So if you have the single mutation, did they see anything really? No. But both of them, and we see something different. Interesting that way. All right, so um, some structural information they give us here. I'll show you a better picture of this hopefully in a minute. Um, so if we're looking at it, panel A, they're showing us it's the dimer, right? Unfortunately, um, they started out with, uh, this is another thing that was really fascinating actually. So you can do this, you can take the sequence information and you can give it to the, pro, it's called Pro, the pro, pro Swiss is what they use, this com computer program you can just go online and use. They dump the information for their sequence, for the duck sequence <laughs> in, because they didn't have the hummingbird structure, but the duck structure exists. And since Google's DeepMind can now predict all these structures, they just dumped the information in and allowed the computer to generate a structure that would be consistent. And they did that for all the different types of mutations. So they have a bunch of, P they have a bunch of PDD files that you could go look at and examine what's going on here. And so here, they have a surface rendering of it and they have this protein in there. You can kind of see what's going on. Here's the 83 mutation is here, the 13 mutation is clear up there. All right, so here's the 13, here's the 83. And it turns out that what's interesting between these two with the mutation is notice what's happening with this helix. Small. Yeah. So when we have a serine in there, you see that, see, we see this difference here. All right, and so if you're asking which one's B, you look down here and you say, okay, the oxy is B, the deoxy is C. All right, so how do we know that? Well, there's the oxygen present. No oxygen present in the oh, wow. cell. All right, and so looking at that, which one should be in a more relaxed state? This one here, right? This should be in a more relaxed state. This should be more of a tense state. Now, the mutation does what? Does it add to the tense state or does it subtract from the tense state? Does it enhance binding or does it enhance release? Enhance release. What did the paper say? Binding. What was their conclusion? Why do serine or serine both increase oxygen affinity? Increase the oxygen affinity. In other words, unlike what we do with BPG, right? Which the because the BPG and the IHP, they're they they bind and affect the affinity, right? But the mutation itself enhances the affinity to bind the oxygen. 
which would make sense at 40,000 feet, where there's very little oxygen, that it could bind it. And then to release it, well, that's just a matter of having the effectors be involved. Right. So to make sure I understand the difference between B and C, both mm -hmm. B and C have the mutation, both mutation. The only difference is whether or not they have an oxygen binding. Both. No, uh, Between B and C. Okay, so going back to this, so A is a homology-based structure for the hummingbird. HB is shown. Locations of amino acid replacements are here, shown okay. in the in the cyan chain. Let's see where they say this. It says the deoxy B and the deoxy yeah, C Yeah, well, that just means you have oxygen with or without, but it doesn't say anything more than that, right? Okay. You're just looking at the two differences. So any conformational changes is due to the fact that we have oxygen bound or not. And you can see there's some slight differences in what happened, like right here. Notice it's... Unco it's a here, and then you see this is more like a turned helix. Mm. Yeah, so it, more rigorous stru structure. So if you look at specifically, like for instance, the the beta the beta eta three right. portion, right? That means that in the oxy state, um, which is B, mm -hmm. it's it looks more like an alpha helix. And then if you look at the the deoxy state C, it, it then it, it doesn't. Right. So in other words, it like is more organized or more like tense? Well, see what's interesting is this one should be the tense state, right? And yet this portion right over here doesn't look as organized as it did over here. Oh, okay. Okay, so in other Organized words, and tense don't necessarily mean the same thing. We're just talking about the fact that we see that it's coil here and it's not over there. In other words, having the oxygen in the hemoglobin allows it to be in a much more relaxed or much more stable conformation. Well, a relaxed conformation or the tense. It's hard to say which one's more stable because of the there's so much going intense, on. Right. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it goes back to the idea of the, the Amazon truck. You don't what want does it stable be... mean? You want to make sure that it picks up your package and brings it along, but yeah. you don't want it to hold on to it forever, right? But that gives us an idea that um, because it's in a much more relaxed state when it has the oxygen, it has a high affinity for binding oxygen. That, that possibly might be why. Yes. So the last thing is the structural model. This, so if we're looking at this, what's going on? You see that there are two different states depending on what which one it is, whether it's the mute, whether it's the low elevation or well, this is what was kind of funny about this paper, wasn't it? There are two sites where you can have the IHP bind. Yeah. And if it was the glycine glycine or the serine serine, it preferred the first site. If it was the mixed, it would preferred the second site. Weird. It was weird. And so what that says is it's not it doesn't all work the way we would quote unquote predict, like to say, oh, it's just this and it's done. But rather this is where they talked about the fact that the two are independent mutations, and that doesn't necessarily mean that either one confers anything, but the two together actually will manifest some kind of an outcome okay. that would be different. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's what we see going on. All right, so representing the wild type, beta globin for A, no, 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 okay, type two. Let's see, we're just about done here. So looking at this, we can see all these different types of birds. They claim this is probably the ancestral version of the with the glycine glycine low affinity. All right, they claim that's probably it. And you can see that there's variation up and down across the board of all these different hummingbirds. I have no idea who studies hummingbirds so much. <laughs> but anyway, that's just not what I would have thought about doing in life. All right. But you can see here, so the black, so notice they give you a key over here. Glycine 13, glycine or alanine 83 is black. 13, um, glycine 83, serine or asparagine. All right, it's the gray. And if we're both serines, it's in the white. So you can see the distribution where you can see here's the cluster of those birds that have yeah. this mutation that basically are at higher elevation. And you can see the higher elevation birds right there all line up. Mm. So that's how the sequence information can be utilized to help us understand something. Then we can go and try to analyze the structural information that makes sense of what is happening. All right. And then there's that. Yeah. I don't think we want to look at that too much. Instead, let's go ahead and just break out of here for a second. Let's come down here. Uh, no, we're in the file. All right. So last thing. So if we look at the structure itself, what we can see is these are the two subunits together, what we've seen before. And so down here, 
is one mutation. This right here is the 83 mutation down at this bottom part. Um, interesting enough, the actual duct structure had a asparagine in that position. Fortunately, with pymol, you can go and you can mutagenize it to a different amino acid. And so that's what we did, and we changed that one over. So it's now serine instead. Now, what's interesting about that is I do not see anything that the serine would be doing in this particular case, but it's a dimer only. <coughs> so I don't know if the interface on the other side would be useful. But unfortunately, the model did not predict for a full thing. Now, this part down at the bottom here would be our other glycine that's mutated to a serine. All right, and that's on this other helix. And as we saw before, it kind of gives it that bend in the helix. Mm. Helps with that part. So um, probably the interesting, most interesting piece is, if we're looking at it, notice this, the mutations on this helix here. And that, so the end of it's a little more floppy or organized, whichever way you want to look at it. Note, it is also bound to the same helix upon which we have a histidine that is, that is actually proximal. So before we saw within our interface that it was just right over here, now we see there's some kind of a mutation over here that allows to probably influences the binding of this histidine and its, its propensity to actually move in or out on, the, on that iron at ion. So, so it, switching it to a serine affects a histidine way further down the chain. Well, let's just ask one quick question. What's different about serine or glycine? You can hydrogen bond with the serine. You can hydrogen bond with the serine. So there's some capacity to have other interactions with this that could help to hold it in a position. Got it. Whether that's for the affinity to go up or down, that's the thing that would be interesting to look at, the subtle differences in the, the structure itself. So, all right. With that, any last questions about hummingbird stuff? Anything that you don't feel, you, something you still have a question about? Yes? So identify the two sites. Now, what does that word mean? That's something else, right? I'm, yeah. yeah. Anybody, anybody look it up? Anybody take genetics? They probably never used that word in genetics, did they? No. Probably not. Epistatical. If I remember correctly, I know whenever I talk about epistasis, I think about baldness. Yes, baldness is an actual example, yes. Yeah, like it's like a hair color, but you're bald, so you don't see the hair color anyways. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's something that's it's a, it's a different trait or a, mut a mutation that leads to a different trait. That which two? Well, they're asking what are the two sites, and that's one. And yes, that's all they're asking. Yes. So what 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 do you what do you kind of understand about parallelism? Okay, so you can have two different lines going over time, and there can be mutations that happen in those two lines, and they can end up at the same point where you would actually confer two different species of hummingbird that now can go to highland conditions, right? Mm. And the so the, so the first question is: just because you see a bird at high elevation, does that mean it has these point mutations? The answer is no, there could be other, possibility, other possible mutations that could have occurred, right? Yeah. Now, ironically, what do they notice about the sequencing? They, are, they seem to have the double mutation at those glycines, correct? It's 13 and 83. Now, does it mean that, they, that it was one bird that had those mutations and from then on all progeny exist at high elevations? Or could it just be different bird species just mutated and now you have different birds at those locations? And so that's, that's what they're trying to distinguish between, is that there was is there one ancestor or are there possible multiple ancestors? Either way, apparently this is a favored mutation that confers high elevation ability. Is that helping? Okay. Yes? On that same question, yeah, I was just like describe why it's a mutation like like single mutation like this. So is that talking about how like the 
So, so the, it's interesting because what they saw was that if it has the two mutations, they do see it at high elevations, right? Yeah. But they can also see that things are at low land, low land as well. Now, do you need to have higher affinity binding at low land conditions? No, not necessarily. You can survive just fine whether it's good or bad, right, affinity, because there's sufficient oxygen. It's only when there's this pressure as it goes higher in elevation that it becomes manifest as an advantage. And so ultimately, if it's a single mutation, or if it's a double mutation down at low under low land conditions, it doesn't seem to matter because there's no selective pressure until that one hummingbird gets blown clear up in the atmosphere, <laughs> comes down somewhere else, and it survives, or the others all die. Yeah, so you can just think about it. If they have the mutation, they can just live wherever they want. In a sense, they can. Yeah. And so where do you choose to live? Wherever there's plenty of food, right? And plenty of other birds to mate with, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. If there aren't enough, then it doesn't make any difference if there's food. All right. So 10 minutes more. Any other questions? Or we can take any question about this chapter. I'm just kind of going through the questions that I provided that are going to be on the written portion. Yep, you already so, got them. Um, for the, one of the last ones, it's, you know, why is it unlikely that the same mutation would have the effect of genes? Um, would you just say that because it's a huge genome? So like you were saying at the beginning, it might just have a benign effect. That's a good question. So would this work in humans? The way that I would suggest that you, the things you consider, instead because there's not one answer to this question, right? And if I tell you an answer, I'll say everybody's going to get that answer. It's going to look really weird, mm -hmm. All right? <laughs> so the things you should consider are, one, what does that look like? Does this surface play? It's hard to tell why this even works for the hummingbird, right? There was no real structural basis that was actually invoked to say, ah, this is why. But what you want to consider is, does human hemoglobin look like this? So we have Are there four subunits, right? Well, this is just two because they're just showing two. Oh, you know what? Because that's all they're showing here. Now, if it is just two, that would be number one, right? Half, whatever. So, but if we're looking at it, so that's one issue right there. The second one is consider more about the lifestyle of the different organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, they did talk about differences in human populations, though, did they not? Or is that something else I read? Oh, in the okay. So it's background for the slides that were given to you, because it talked about the differences between populations that live at high elevations versus not, and they found that the Andean populations were different than those that were over in Asia and Africa, for example, and especially the ones that were in Asia, basically Himalayas. Those people were definitely different than the other sets, so which then you'd have to ask the question, what is it that's going on? So consider it in terms of habitat when you're trying to discuss what the differences could be, why it would, would or would not make a difference. Um, could the different allosteric effectors make a difference? Allosteric effectors can play a role, definitely. Definitely can. Because the question is, are you going to go out and mutate your baby so they have this ability? Only if it's advantageous. <laughs> The boy or girl. <laughs> I would only advocate one mutation. Make sure they have a cellulase they can express. Yeah, then they can eat grass. <laughs> or leaves, or whatever. They'll never starve. They would never starve. Wow. So, there you go. All right, any questions about uh, protein structure generally? I don't know. What was the, what's the testable material? Chapters four and five? Oh, make your kids change. Chapters four and five, any questions out of those? <laughs> I'll run one thing by you just as a quick thing to note. What stabilizes primary structure? Hydrogen bond. Primary structure. It's a covalent bond. What kind of covalent amide bond? bond? It's the amide bond, right? Okay, so your peptide bond itself is what makes primary structure. That's what makes it stable, right? Yeah. If you don't have it, you don't have it. That's all there is to it. What about secondary structure? Hydrogen bonding, right? It, within the chain itself for the helix and then between the chains of the beta sheets, right? 
All right, so what about tertiary structure? What stabilizes tertiary structure? The disulfides? Or is that uh, disulfides there? eventually do, but what's the primary driver of tertiary structure first and foremost? Because you can get a little of everything else, but it's the hydrophobic effect, the collapse of the hydrophobic groups on the secondary structural elements that come in and stabilize. In other words, it's an entropically driven process. Water does not want to be there. And as water is dispersed, entropy is favored, protein is stable. It's how we get a stable, folded protein that functions as a machine with very low energetic cost in the universe. Right. Quaternary structure. Yes. <laughs> Mostly the variations of, it's, it's not so much the hydrophobic in most cases because that doesn't work well unless there's a conformational change that allows it to stick to something else. So most of the time it's going to be some kind of ionic interaction, hydrogen bonding, just polar type, some kind of polar interactions. So that's, that's They specific. can even be some covalent linkages that can happen at times. It's more specific to the case you're looking at. Okay. All right. Uh, we saw a few examples of interactions between subunits with hemoglobin, but we didn't really look at the face of the two interacting with each other. All right. But there's got to be something that matches up well. So the first three are very distinct. The last one is kind of like, eh. Right. Okay. All right, other questions? Chapters four or five. So from the study guide, what's the Bohr effect? What is the Bohr effect? It's oh, an hour of listening to me. <laughs> he's, he's just likes to likes to make me feel good. <laughs> the Bohr effect. Carbon dioxide, pH, what effect do they have on, on protein or on a on a hemoglobin? pH goes up, what happens with hemoglobin? Oxygen. Oxygen binding is enhanced, right? pH goes down, carbon dioxide, well, pH goes down, oxygen binding is released, right? So, and then if we look at carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide transportations go up, the affinity goes down. down. Remember, carbon dioxide concentration goes up, what happens to the pH? It goes down, because it's causing it. So you have to watch out for that thing, okay? But the basic premise is that at higher pHs, you have a higher affinity for oxygen, lower pHs, you have a lower affinity for oxygen. Okay. Right. Other questions? What was Affinson's experiment? Affinson's experiment. That was ribonuclease A. Mm. Remember ribonuclease A? They took this protein that's actually really stable. Ribonuclease, right. they chew up RNA all the time. And so what did they do with it? They took the protein and put it in what conditions? Urea. Urea, Urea. chaotropic agent to help the protein unfold, right? What else did they add? Tumor capped ethanol, a reductant. Because ribonuclease A has disulfide bonds helping to stabilize the tertiary structure. That's very common with proteins that are exposed to oxygen extensively. Okay, that's when you'll see a lot of disulfide bonds. So things circulating in blood, not uncommon at all. Cool. All right, so they took those away, and what happened to the protein? Went in a straight line. It, it, it lost activity. That's the, you can definitely say that much. It didn't work anymore. All right, so the idea is that it somehow like, had less stable structure, so it couldn't function as the catalyst. But then what did they do? They took, it back they took away the chaotropic agent, and they took away the reductant, and the protein folded back together. What's the, what, what, what came of that besides, oh, that was cool. Okay, the primary structure must contain the information sufficient for folding. Now, is that true in all cases, that it can just spontaneously fold on its own? No, that's where you get chaperones, right? Chaperones sometimes are there to assist either in the folding process as it emerges from the ribosome or to help it get back, get itself back together, all right? This is like intervention. Your roommate's going nuts. They, you, you go, hold on, sit down. And you keep them there until they calm down, and then you're good to step away, and they've got it together. So you're like, okay, that protein did not open up and get clumped together with other proteins because the hydrophobic regions were inappropriately active. <laughs> Whoa. Yes. Kind of roommate you got. That's what chaperones are for, right? What kind of protein? Keep us up. That's why your mom went on a date with you. 
also take away from that the behavior spontaneously all the food are made of sticks from most stable as well? Yes, that's that's the conclusion. All, but not all proteins do that necessarily. They can that's where you get the energy funnel well that was on the one question, where they can find stable states along the way, but it doesn't mean they make it all the way down to the final native state. Sometimes there's a protein that's gotta like give it some time. All right. All right. Got time for one more short. Come on, somebody's got a question. It's dying. You gotta ask it. What, I mean, this is not your class, but what are we supposed to write on the write on section and the words to The hummingbird stuff? Yeah. I'm not the one that made up the question, so okay. I can honestly say I did not make up that question. There are some others that occasionally show up that are like, hey, I made that one. <laughs> <laughs> but this one is not mine. This is what about him. He found it. And it's his, it's his. He likes bees and hummingbirds, apparently. <laughs> All right. If you have any more questions, just come ask. All right, guys. Have a good weekend.